You are listening to Lighthearted, the official podcast of the United States Lighthouse Society. My name is Jeremy Dontremont. Welcome. My co-host today is Jen Lewis, fundraising and outreach manager for the Point Cabrillo Lightkeepers Association in California. Hi, Jen. Hi, Jeremy. So good to be back. Today is April 30th, 2023, and this is episode 223 of Lighthearted. In a few minutes, we're going to listen to a conversation about Alki Point Lighthouse in Seattle, Washington. First, Jen, let me ask you, how are things going at Point Cabrillo? Uh, you had that serious wave damage back in January. Is the lighthouse now open to the public? It sure is. Yep. We were able to open back up at the end of January. So we are back back to almost normal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we definitely still have quite a few projects that we're working on as a uh, follow-up to the wave damage. So we're going to be getting our back doors replaced. That is a big project. So we'll hopefully have that going by the middle of summer. Mm -hmm. And then we are also really excited because we are completely redoing the museum displays inside the lighthouse for the first reason, because everything got very wet and is not looking at its best. Uh, but for the second reason, it was it was time. You know, We're excited to have some new exhibits in there. And uh, hopefully the next time you guys come by, it's going to have a huge display on the waves at Point Cabrillo. <laughs> <laughs> which will yeah. be one to include. Well, that definitely, definitely. That's a historic event there. And I hope I uh, get back. I haven't been there since 2015, so I'd really love to visit again. Uh, in more recent history, uh, since those those big waves that day in January, there's uh, certainly those of us uh, on the East Coast and all over the country have seen in the news all the crazy weather all over California and floods and everything. Has it been more or less okay recently where you are? It has. Yeah, it's finally cleared up. We've gotten some sunny, sunny days out here. It's been nice to feel like we can dry out a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. The wind is definitely picking up because that's our, our springtime normal is just lots of wind. But what's really wonderful is after all those storms, after all that water, our wildflowers mm -hmm. are going to be so perfect this year. The wallflowers out on the lighthouse bluff have been blooming for the last couple weeks, and they have been so much brighter than ever before. And we're just so excited to see the poppies and the lilies and everything start popping up in the next couple of weeks. When I was there in 2015, that's one of the things that really, you know, really stayed with me. And you see them in a lot of my photographs from that trip, the wildflowers, just seas of yellow and, uh, and purple. I think those are the most common colors. I'm not sure exactly. what the flowers were. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. But uh, it was just so, so gorgeous. It's it's my favorite time of year. You know, we just, we passed the time of the, the whale migration and it mixes in with the wildflower season. And it is just, it's a beautiful place to be in the springtime. To change the subject a little bit, you were the co-host uh, for a recent episode where we discussed the Yaquina lights in Oregon. Uh, I always like having you as a co-host when we're discussing lighthouses on the West Coast. You have personal experience with a lot of them, certainly. You told me that you have not visited our subject today, which is Alki Point Lighthouse in Seattle, but you have visited the city of Seattle, right? Uh, I was just there for the fourth time. It's a, it's a great city, of course. It sure is. I absolutely love visiting Seattle. I have a, a lot of friends and family up in that area growing up in the Pacific Northwest. And every time I get a chance to visit up there, I'm always just I'm just really impressed. It's such a beautiful area and Puget Sound is such a cool spot. Mm -hmm. And uh, next time I'm there, I'm definitely going to be visiting more lighthouses. Yeah, I actually uh, I was, I was staying at the Point No Point uh, light station in Hansville, mm -hmm. Washington, which is about maybe 45 minutes from Seattle. But I, I had my last day. I, I was on my own all day in Seattle and I, I saw something called the Chihuly Glass Museum. Do you know Ooh, about that? No, I um, don't. Chihuly is a, a, a glass sculptor, so it's, these are all his works of art, and it's one of the most impressive things I've seen in my life. Uh, people should look up the, the Chihuly Museum. It was absolutely fantastic, right next to the Space Needle. Very uh, cool. I also went to Pike Place, uh, of course. Of course. Um, the market there, which was so crowded, I could could barely move at lunchtime, but it was, <laughs> it was it was fun. Yeah. Well, good job calling it Pike Place and not Pike's Place. So you did good there. <laughs> okay, right, 
Right. It, it, right. It's not Pike's Place, even though people say that a lot, right? Yes. Yeah. One of the places that I visited on my last uh, my last trip up to the Seattle area, it's a little bit north of Seattle. It's the Hebulb Cultural Center. It's this very cool place that talks all about, you know, the the native history of Puget Sound and um, that that area of Washington, really impressive museum and just a very cool place to spend a couple hours. Yeah. And another place around there that is fantastic is right next to Seattle, basically, is Bainbridge Island. It's such an interesting island and they have a, uh, my, a memorial to the uh, the Japanese internment in World War Ooh. II. Oh, wow. Uh, and I went to that and it was fantastic. And very the, cool. Yeah. So anyway, we, we could go on here. I'm sure there's a lot. We sure could. We sure could. Yeah, a lot to see in that area. But uh, at this point, could you help me tell everyone about Alki Point Lighthouse and today's guest, uh, Deborah Alderman? Sure thing, Jeremy. Long before white settlers arrived, Washington's Puget Sound region was occupied by native peoples. The city of Seattle was named for a chief of the Suquamish and Duwamish people, which makes it the only major city in the U.S. named after a native chief. Elliott Bay on Puget Sound in Washington extends southeastward from West Point in the north and Alki Point in the south. Seattle was founded on the bay and the city now surrounds it completely. The bay has served as a key element of the local economy, enabling the port of Seattle to become one of the busiest ports in the United States. Alki Point is at the southern entrance to Elliott Bay. The first navigational light at Alki Point was a kerosene lantern hung on the side of a barn in the 1870s by the property owner Hans Martin Hansen. The Lighthouse Board eventually recognized the need for something more substantial, and a lens lantern was installed on a wooden post at the point. Hansen kept the light at a salary of $15 per month. In 1913, the present structure was completed. It consists of a 37-foot-tall octagonal brick tower attached to a fog signal building. Two residences were also constructed for the keepers and their families. The station was automated in 1984, and the principal keeper's quarters became the home of the commander of the 13th Coast Guard District. Today, Coast Guard auxiliarists provide public tours on most Sunday afternoons between Memorial Day weekend and Labor Day weekend. Deborah Alterman serves as the Coast Guard Auxiliary's Project Officer for Public Tours at Alki Point Lighthouse. She has been instrumental in outreach events for the Auxiliary across South Seattle. I visited Alki Point when I was in Washington just a couple of weeks ago, as we were talking about, and Deborah arranged for a docent named Dale Vodica to meet me at the lighthouse and show me around. I want to thank both of them for that. It was uh, great. I had a wonderful time. Uh, I spoke with Deborah via Zoom after I got back home, so let's listen to our conversation now. I'm speaking today with Deborah Alderman, uh, who is with the Coast Guard Auxiliary out in Washington State uh, and is very involved with uh, tours and other things going on at Alki Point Lighthouse in Seattle. And I was just there a couple of weeks ago. I was uh, spent a week staying at the the uh, U.S. Lighthouse Society headquarters at Point No Point, and uh, got to visit Alki Point. Thanks to Deborah, a uh, great docent, Dale uh, showed me around that day. I had a, a wonderful time. Uh, it's a beautiful place. So we're going to talk about Alki Point today. Thank you so much, Deborah, for being with me. Well, it's a pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. So before we uh, start talking about the lighthouse, I'm wondering if we could just talk a little bit about your background. I was uh, reading a, a bit about that. It sounds uh, like you have a lot of interesting background. And one thing was you were the director of something called the Steamer Virginia Five Foundation for about three right. years. Do I have right. that right? Right. Absolutely. And there's definitely a connection between my um, volunteer work at the lighthouse and my um, that leading me into that position, which I held for about three and a quarter years. So I was the executive director of a heritage uh, foundation. And all that organization does is own, operate, and preserve and interpret a 100-year-old steamship called the Virginia Five. It's the Roman numeral five. It's the last remaining steam steamship of the Puget Sound Mosquito Fleet. And it's a wonderful historic resource. It still operates as a Coast Guard inspected passenger vessel, which is hmm. pretty amazing with its original steam engine. 
And so um, it may be only one of a couple of wooden steamships that still operate in, in the whole country. And we're just really, um, it's a precious resource. And so I'm, even though I've just retired and I'm in the middle of turning over the reins to my successor, I still plan to be involved as a, as a volunteer. Mm -hmm. But um, it's been really a, an honor to do that. And I, I've learned a lot in that role that I've contributed to my work at the Lighthouse and vice versa. Sure. And um, so it's it's kind of a nice melding of, of interests there. So, yeah. Yeah. So and if Virginia... people want to come and visit the Virginia Five or, or get aboard, they can go to the website of the organization and learn more about it. Um, and it is a nonprofit organization and they're mm -hmm. welcome to check that out. And it shares a, a historic ship's wharf um, just north of downtown Seattle on Lake Union with um, a historic light ship, as well mm -hmm. as several other historic vessels, which I think you got to go down there and visit those when you're in Seattle. Yeah, I did make it uh, down there. There, uh, the vessels are right uh, by the museum. Uh, and help me with the name of the museum. I know it goes. They go by Mohe or Mohai. Mohe, Mohe, <laughs> the Museum of History for. and Industry. Right. Yeah, it was and, a great museum. I really enjoyed yeah. that. And the vessels are kind of uh, on the waterfront there by the museum. The Swift mm -hmm. Shore Lightship was kind of uh, shrink wrapped when I was there. Yeah. The yeah. Wearing winter. It's under winter restoration. Yeah. 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 But that, that, of course, is um, you probably have done uh, podcast episodes about light ships, and that is one of the remaining ones in the country. Mm. And so hopefully actually, in the future, it will be available for tours. But right now it's not. But you can see right. it from the dock. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's actually the oldest light ship in the country actually surviving. Yeah. yeah. And I, I do uh, hope to devote a, an upcoming episode to that as well. So how did you uh, get involved with the Coast Guard Auxiliary and how did you get involved with Alki Point Lighthouse? Well, the two things are extremely related. Um, I had mm -hmm. moved from the suburbs to West Seattle, which is part of Seattle. It's kind of a peninsula um, sticking out into Puget Sound. And that was about 2000 or excuse me. Yeah, 2013 and um, took a tour of the lighthouse. And of course that was the lighthouse's centennial year. And um, as my husband and I were touring, we started visiting with some of the auxiliary docents, the Coast Guard auxiliary docents who were there on site that day. And one of them suggested that we get involved with the auxiliary, found out that we were soon to be empty nesters and boaters and um, said, hey, you're our kind of people. And of course, I'm a history geek. And so sure enough, within a year, I was involved in giving the tours at the lighthouse. And of course, living right here in West Seattle, it was very convenient for me to be involved. And um, so I've been leading tours down there and kind of organizing the, the logistics of the tours for about 10 years now. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's pretty fun. And the Coast Guard Auxiliary, um, if people aren't familiar, is the volunteer civilian part of the Coast Guard. We There's actually more auxiliarists than active duty <laughs> um, Coast Guard. And in some parts of the country, the auxiliary is is the only representation of the Coast Guard. Um, and so the 13th district is Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and Montana. And of course in Montana, the auxiliarists are the, they're the, they're the Coast Guard out there. So people in the auxiliary do a variety of different ways of supporting recreational boating safety and supporting the Coast Guard in, in most of their mission areas with the exception of anything policing or military, anything like that, we're mm -hmm. not involved with, but supporting boating safety and safety of the, um, the shipping industry, fishing boats, pollution prevention, anything like that, we're very yeah. involved. So, Yeah, I'm uh, aware of a lot of what the auxiliary does here in the Northeast as well, and they are involved with some of the lighthouses uh, in mm -hmm. this part of the country too, including Chatham Light on Cape Cod, which I've <laughs> featured on the podcast. Auxiliary runs uh, tours there as well. Uh, I know that Alki Point itself, and I'll, I want to mention that uh, for years I was never sure how to pronounce it, and it is pronounced Alki, right? Spelled A. -L -K -I. That's the way we pronounce it now. Mm -hmm. Alki is um, it's a word from the Chinook. It wasn't really a native language as much as a trade language. That was sort of a right. hybrid of different. It had very simple, simplified vocabulary. So it was the language that native tribes in the Northwest used amongst themselves for trading, as well as um, to communicate with white people. And so, yeah, there's a whole story about how the original 
white settlers to this area when they arrived they had big plans to start a city they were going to call it new york right and people thought that was a little bit audacious <laughs> so they were kind of on the edge of the planet there in a couple of log cabins and they said yeah our, our city's gonna be called new york so yeah. according to legend somebody suggested to them that they amend the name new york and call it alki new york alki meaning by and by, eventually, maybe okay. you'll get there. <laughs> so and, that's what um, Alki means, yeah. And then eventually the New York part got dropped. So, um, but so I've, I've looked into the the actual original pronunciation of the word Alki, and a native Lachute speaker. That's the that's the actual native language that's that was used in the Puget Sound area, named Vi Hilbert. She was very well known, uh, passed away a few years ago. She recorded the the um, actual pronunciation, and it's on YouTube. And the way she pronounced it was Eshki. And I'm probably not really doing justice to that, but Eshki with a mm. little bit of gurgle in the back of your mouth, you know, Eshki. And you know how native words tend to get corrupted. So anyway, it, it probably, I'm guessing it m morphed into Alki and then, in, and then eventually Alki. And we don't know exactly when that, yeah. how that all worked out. We're, yeah. We don't have a record of that, but um, we do call it Alki now. Could you say a little bit more about that early settlement in the mid 1800s? It was the called the Denny party, right? And uh, when that uh, ha happened, when those people settled, uh, what was going on in Puget Sound at that time? Yeah, so of course there were Native people living here since time immemorial on Puget Sound using the land and the water to live pretty prosperously. And they were, you know, they were, we have a pretty mild climate here and the Northwest Natives are known to have really highly elevated art forms and um, that are still really admired today. And in the, in the mid 1800s, um, this area sort of got opened up for settlement um, to American settlers. But before that, there were trading posts and things like that. But finally, the boundaries between what was going to be part of England, you know, basically the boundary between the United States and Canada got settled. And then all of a sudden, there were a lot more um, Americans kind of settling north of the Columbia River. So um, this group called the Denny Party came across the country on the Oregon Trail, got themselves to Portland, Oregon. And then they sent some scouts up ahead to go north and look for a good place for their city that they were going to start. And um, so the, the advance party found this place on Puget Sound that they thought would be really great. And they sent back word to um, the folks down waiting in Portland, including several families, and um, and they got a ship to bring them up. So by the time the ship came uh, and dropped them off just down the street from the lighthouse, where the lighthouse is now, um, it was November of 1851, and the weather here is not so great in November. It was pouring rain. The cabin wasn't done. One of the guys got hurt. You know? <laughs> it's just mm. a, kind of a cluster there. Um, and uh, anyway, they they were they were a hardy bunch, and they survived their first winter thanks to some of these native folks um, from the Duwamish and the Squamish tribe who were in the area and said, "Oh man, these white people." <laughs> They don't know what they're doing. And um, there's a there's a phrase that we use in the Northwest, which probably um, came from from the native folks in the area that when the tide is out, the table is set. And there's all this wonderful shellfish. I'm sure it was really abundant um, back in the day. And um, so nobody really needed to starve here. And there were roots and things that, of course, were very unfamiliar to the the, the white settlers. And mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, so it was kind of like the real pilgrim story, you know, <laughs> where the where there were actually really good relationships between um, the settlers and the natives, at least at first. And unfortunately, that did not last. And because of some national policies, um, eventually all the native people got pushed out of what it, what became the city of Seattle. And um, mm -hmm. so, but beginning back to, to Alki Point, the area was, there was a donation homesteading claim by two of those Denny party, the brothers, the Terry brothers originally, they swapped it with a guy that came along a little bit later, David Maynard, Doc, we call him Doc Maynard, who was very instrumental in building the city of Seattle, was very good friends with Chief Seattle. And then Doc Maynard sold it to a couple of Scandinavian immigrants, the Hansons, and uh, they were either brothers or cousins, and um, and they settled there. And so they were farming the point in the 1860s, 70s, 80s, and that's where kind of the the, the lighthouse story picks up. Yeah, that is what I want to get into next, uh, as you 
mentioned the basically the story of a, a navigational light at Alki Point starts uh, in the 1870s with a private uh, property owner there, uh, and eventually a post light, and eventually the the lighthouse. But why was a navigational light needed at Alki Point in the first place? Well, that is a really good question. I have really looked into that. So, you know, this is one of the challenges whenever you're building an interpretive program is that you receive the interpretive materials that people who've come before you have developed. <laughs> you are looking at secondary sources in newspapers and books and things like that. And mm -hmm. you find that there's sometimes not even good collaboration between all of those different sources. And you start to suspect that some of the stuff was just made up. Hmm. And <laughs> it's really hard to know what the real it truth is. is. But so I've looked into whether there were really actually a lot of shipwrecks at this point. Was that the reason? And I've actually read that this farmer, Hansen, who was living at the point, had seen ships foundering out there. And that's why he started hanging a light on his property as a mm -hmm. as just to be a good citizen um out of the goodness of his heart he started hanging up this lantern every night but i can't find any evidence that there were any shipwrecks back in the sailing ship days mm -hmm. the shipwrecks that we know about were more as we got into the age of steamships and that mosquito fleet that i mentioned that the virginia five was part of there were there was a big accident that we know about in the early part of the 20th century where the um where two ships basically just foolhardy seamanship one tried to overtake the other and they bashed into each other and they you know th there was loss of life it was it was very sad um and there was another steamship where it's like boiler blew up right off the point and it kind of sank in shallow water there so those are the kind of shipwrecks that i i have been able to document i have not found that there were any sailing ship wrecks right off of alki point in any case hansen starts hanging out this lantern according to legend of course this wasn't that long ago it was you know just over 100 years ago. So there, over the 20th century, there were descendants of the Hansen family that were able to corroborate some of this. So we're pretty sure that, that Hans Hansen started ha hanging out this lantern. And then within a few years, probably the lighthouse service, um, the government came along and said, hey, could we hire you to be the official light keeper here? And we'll upgrade your technology. We'll build a post lantern here on mm -hmm. the point and then it'll be your date you know your secondary job your side hustle to work for us every single night of the rest of your life how about that yeah. or as long as you own the property and that's what he did and he did that job until he died and then his oldest son inherited that piece of the property and picked up the job um, when he when he mm -hmm. inherited the property so um, for about another 10 years until it was acquired by the government to build the lighthouse we see today. So I always tell people that this is actually the third light at Alki Point. Um, and so this one's been lit for 10, 10 years. years. Yeah. yeah. And I think Hansen was paid something like $15 a month, was it, to uh, be the keeper of that post light? I think I remember so that, that's right. a piece of information that, yeah, has been handed down to us. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And I would Sounds imagine he right. might have gotten a raise at some point in all those <laughs> years. But yeah, yeah. I, something on that order. And then he was provided with the um, the supplies that he needed for that. So, mm -hmm. well, for a, a, that type of a would would have been considered kind of a minor aid to navigation, a post light. That sounds, and he already had his house right there anyway, right? right. So, so I guess this was very typical that they would hire people who owned coastal properties to to be light keepers and and maintain their lights. And so the post lantern that we have on display at the lighthouse is is an actual genuine post lantern. It's a couple feet high um, mm -hmm. and would have held eight days worth of fuel. So I think some of these post lanterns were actually maybe on rocks offshore and you had to row out to them. So they were built so that you didn't have to extinguish the flame every single night. Um, they could they could go for a few days without being maintained. But um, he yeah. did need to, you know, because it was actually on land, I'm sure that they did maintain it pretty frequently mm -hmm. and even got the neighbors and the family members involved with that anytime. Uh, he had to be away. Yeah, I, I think the uh, the light on that post light was uh, something that was referred to as a lens lantern that was used in some places. And I saw that uh, display at the lighthouse when I was there. There's, it's actually a replica, right? It's not the actual lens it's lantern. It's not a replica. It is a, an actual one. Oh, it's not the one that was there. It's not there. the one. Okay, okay. <laughs> it is an actual post lantern. The, the one that was at Halkite Point, interestingly, 
is now in the museum, the Coast Guard Museum at Bay Seattle, which people can visit. They should probably go on the website and make mm -hmm. an appointment because, you know, it's on a base. You can't just walk on. Um, yeah. But we do have a, a number of interesting things. And we have auxiliarists who actually um, open the museum and are the docents there. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, that, that particular lantern was stolen out of the lighthouse at some point and um, was eventually recovered down in California. I think it had sat in somebody's attic. And then when that person died and the somebody went to sell it, the antique dealer said, yeah, I think this is government <laughs> property and got a hold of the government. And it turned out, well, okay, again, according to legend, that um, nobody had polished it in many years and the fingerprints were still on there from the culprit who is... <laughs> <laughs> legend you know who knows if this is yeah. all true but yeah but anyway it was recovered and now it's all um you know very mm -hmm. very shined up and you know we don't polish any of the brass at our lighthouse um we're not supposed to touch anything frankly because of the historic significance but also because there's lead paint mm -hmm. um present and we're not really supposed to be doing any cleaning so unfortunately when people come to visit the lighthouse they won't see everything all ship shaped the way it was back in the day when there were keepers there and they kept mm -hmm. everything beautiful because they could be inspected and they wanted to always getting you know top marks for the way they were keeping the lighthouse yeah well the lighthouse certainly looks beautiful from the outside and uh inside you got some nice displays i really enjoyed the the whole visit so uh, back to the the history of the place, let's talk a little little bit about the human history. I understand there was actually a principal keeper. Well, this is, of course, after the, the actual lighthouse that stands today was right. built, which was in 1913. Uh, for many years, there was a principal keeper and also an assistant keeper. Why did they need two keepers for the lighthouse? Yeah, so they had a pretty busy job there at Alki Point. Um, of course, I think all lighthouse keepers were pretty busy, but this particular situation, initially, there was no electricity at the point for about the first five years uh, it, that the lighthouse was there. So um, they had to haul liquid fuel up to light the the flames inside the the big lens and of course that was sooty so there was a lot of cleaning involved in keeping the lens and um, the glass and the in the lens room clean and then mm -hmm. um, we have uh, fog signal equipment there I think that there was quite a lot of manual involvement and then you know if there was a fog that went on for hours and hours and hours somebody had to be down there even after you know through the through the 20th century um, somebody still had to, and I was looking at, you know, some placards around the lighthouse just the other day. It actually tells the keeper that you have to, you have to be checking with, you know, with your watch, you have to make sure that that fog signal is repeating the, the correct signature, especially when there was fog, there was just a lot of work to do. They had to start up the compressor, which put compressed air into the tank that squirted air out of these giant horns on the three sides of the lighthouse facing the water and you know probably they didn't have a lot of you know personal protective gear at that time so who knows these guys probably had some some hearing damage from all that yeah. so in addition in order to have the the lens rotate and provide the the visual signal at night um which was run by clockwork they had to go down there and wind up that clockwork Yep. At, I would think at least twice a night. It's a short tower and we have long nights here in the Northwest. Yeah. In the wintertime. So, um, so it, it really was, you know, they had, they had two full, you know, a keeper and an assistant keeper who worked 12 hour shifts and, you know, it was really a full-time job to, to maintain this lighthouse and all the different things. And then lighthouse keepers were tended to be, they, you know, they had um, a salary. It was an okay salary and they could go to the store and buy things, but yeah, I'm sure the the um, the keepers and their families were busy doing a little bit of gardening, and they we know that they had a goat shed and they raised goats, and they were responsible for doing a lot of just maintenance on the property and the outbuildings and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I'm sure they kept pretty busy. Oh, I'm sure they did. I think there was plenty of plenty to do for two keepers for sure, and probably family members had various chores too. The other thing that I didn't mention is that that would keep our keepers very busy back in the day was that this lighthouse was in charge of starting up fog signals in other lo unmanned locations. Um, one over on Bainbridge Island, kind of across Puget Sound, and another point of land 
on on Elliott Bay. Um, that's part of the peninsula where Elkai Point is called Duwamish Head, mm -hmm. and um, and also just monitoring other aids to navigation in the area. So so that was part of the keeper's job as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fairly common too. A lot of lighthouse keepers had to look out for other local aids to navigation in addition to their lighthouses. For about at least the last 10, 12 years, the, the fog signal has been silenced because, yeah. you know, the big ships have all that, those electronics and they, they know that there's a point there, so they're not going to bump into it. And so, um, yeah, it's just, it's just yeah. the story of, of technology as it advances. Absolutely. Yeah. Some fog signals have been discontinued around the country and most of the ones that are still active are now Mariner activated, as you probably exactly. know, where people use their VHF radios to turn the horns on. You don't hear and them There much are anymore. some like that in Puget Sound. We're not mm -hmm. one of them. So anything else about the human history that kind of stands out for you? Any particular personalities among the keepers or anything like that? You know, I think that there have been some very interesting keepers over the years. There was a, a particular keeper who was known to be um, quite an expert on Walt Whitman. I guess they did have some free time, these keepers. And in his 12 hours off, he was uh, became quite the, the expert on Walt Whitman. And um, his name was Charles Elliott. And he was the mm -hmm. keeper back in the 30s. And he was written up in the in the local newspapers, and um, so yeah, we 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 definitely have a little bit of information about some of the keepers and their families, um, but we don't have possession of the keepers' logs, and I believe those are in the national archives. And I have done a little bit of checking to see if any of that material has been digitized, and I'm not sure that it really is. And even the finding aids that are available online on the national archives website are. I'm, I haven't been able to dig deep enough to find out if they have the logs from Alki Point, but I would love it if we had a volunteer who could um, pursue that and maybe get at least some of those logs digitized, at least some exciting, you know, mm -hmm. high points of the of the years that it was manned. And, um, you know, at other lighthouses that I visited, they have done a really nice job of taking either correspondence from the lighthouse keepers or their widows or um, or pages from the log about kind of exciting episodes and blowing them up and putting them on display. And I, I think even having a dramatic recreation of, you know, communications um, that, that visitors can listen to, I think that's very effective. Mm -hmm. And I would love to see us sort of move in that direction with, with our interpretation. Um, yeah. So there's always room for improvement. Absolutely. I oh, I'd yeah. love to, to see how we can get more material and continue to make it a more engaging experience for our visitors. Yeah. I once spent about a week in Washington, D.C. at the National Archives and the Library of Congress and the U.S. Coast Guard Historian's Office. They are gradually digitizing stuff that's on the National Archives website thousands of photographs of lighthouses around the country and some other related materials have been digitized, but not the log books yet, which hopefully will, will happen as time goes on. But there's an awful lot of material there, especially if you're talking about every page in those log books. There's a lot of, a lot of person hours involved to get that stuff digitized. Oh, for sure. For yeah. sure. So anything else before we move on about keepers at the station? We do know a little bit about the the final days of the lighthouse, um, and that we um, we had a civilian lighthouse keeper until about 1970, and then the Coast Guard did fully take over the the maintenance of the lighthouse. But they allowed, you know during those last few years they allowed um, the that last civilian keeper to stay on site until he retired, and and so the the Coast Guard guys were helping him out, and then Coast Guard. Uh, personnel were actually keeping the lighthouse um, until 1984 when it was completely automated and of course that automation process was a process as well it wasn't just suddenly you know but mm -hmm. the fully fully automated um, transition was in 1984 which is one of the very last if not the last one in our area to be fully automated mm -hmm. and so um, at that point the the Coast Guard personnel just sort of started becoming groundskeepers and maintaining the outbuildings and things like that. Mm -hmm. So today we have um, people living on the site, but they are not lighthouse keepers. Yes. So, um, so the, for quite a number of years now, since the time of the retirement of um, that light, that last keeper and 
the moving away of the um, Coast Guard personnel to to be billeted elsewhere. So one of the, the original head lighthouse keepers residence is now lived in by the Admiral. Um, that is the, the commander of the entire 13th district of the of the Coast Guard um, and his family and mm -hmm. usually him. It's been a him ever since I've started anyway, but one of yeah. these days we'll get a lady. Sure. Um, and then the other residence, quarters B, is lived in usually by either uh, a captain who is, like, for instance, right now, the captain who lives there is the chief of staff of the entire district. Mm -hmm. um, and then we've had other residents there who were the command master chief of the 13th district, which is the the highest ranking enlisted um, person of the of the district, which I think is kind of cool. So yeah, so we've had in my ten years with the lighthouse, we've had a number of them move in, move out, move in, move out. Um, for the admirals, many times it's their last it's their last position before retiring. Mm -hmm. So the the pinnacle of their their career is that they get to live at Alki Lighthouse, which I think is cool. And many of them are super excited about living there. They love it. It's a beautiful location. Mm -hmm. And um, they they just uh, are very supportive of the tours, which I think is really nice because we're walking through their backyard every Sunday afternoon in the summer. And um, they're very patient about that. And some of them are super enthusiastic and very, um, very big boosters of our tours. So, um, so we always have these transitions right at the beginning of the summer with people coming and going. So we have to get, get some new folks oriented to having tours in their backyard. Yeah, yeah. When I was there and uh, Dale, the docent, showed me around, uh, there were a couple of dogs running around. I think they were uh, from the uh, Admiral's family. Uh, uh, well, the little white dog is the Admiral's dog and the two black dogs are the um, the captain captain's dogs. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, there was a, a black dog and a, it seemed like a, maybe a yellow lab or something like that, if I remember. Oh, right. that might have been a, uh, either they got a new dog or that might have been a visiting pooch. Okay. Um, <laughs> I've seen that one. But anyway, the uh, grounds are beautifully kept and everything. It re It's very similar to a situation we have here in New England. The, the admiral in charge, the commander of the first Coast Guard district, lives at Hospital Point Lighthouse in Beverly, oh, wow. Massachusetts. I uh, and I've that. been to, you know, I've been to a couple of receptions there, and that's a really beautiful property. Uh, and I think that um, mm -hmm. auxiliary members actually do give tours there. I don't know if they give tours regularly there, but I have seen that they do that on occasion. At Hospital Point, they do. Yeah. Yes, I've been there when they've yeah. done that. Yeah, they do do that exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you a question here as far as public access. We'll start uh, getting to that a little bit. When uh, it's not open for tours, and I want to talk about how the tours work in a minute, but when it's not open for tours, can people, lighthouse buffs, whoever, uh, people who want to get a look at the lighthouse, get a photo of it, is there a decent photographic view without taking one of the tours? There are a couple of places where you can get um, a, a good shot at the lighthouse. I usually recommend what people do is they park a little bit south of the lighthouse on the street. There is parking right on the street, just south of the lighthouse, next to a public beach. And mm -hmm. if you walk down to the beach and then walk back toward the point, but I would recommend doing this at low tide. Um, <laughs> um, and then you walk along the beach, you can get right next to the lighthouse, right outside the perimeter fence of the property. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you could take, get some very nice shots there. You can also walk down kind of a little side street it almost looks like a driveway um, just on the other side of the lighthouse property. And you could get a pretty good shot on the outside of the perimeter fence from that side as well. So yeah, if people are interested. So um, generally we don't give off off season tours because it is, it's actually pretty darn cold down there in the winter time. <laughs> and uh, no matter what I tell people about dressing warmly, they don't and they're freezing and it's not a very good experience. And um, so we generally don't, but we can, um, Sometimes, especially for groups or school groups, we can do out of season tours. And mm -hmm. I do have auxiliary volunteers that that can come down and help with things like that. So I would just say contact us via our e our email and get in touch with us. Give us plenty of notice, and um, maybe we can arrange something. Uh, but generally, our tours are every Sunday afternoon, almost every Sunday afternoon between Memorial Day and Labor Day weekend. Mm -hmm. um, occasionally, the Coast Guard asks us not to do tours on a particular weekend. And I know for sure this year, um, the July 4th weekend, we're not going to be doing tours because the Admiral's retirement ceremony will have just happened. And there's going to be a lot of people around, visitors and stuff. So they've asked us not to give tours that weekend. Mm -hmm. um, so 
generally that's, we kind of keep that scheduled. Basically we start our tour season Memorial Day, the Sunday of Memorial Day weekend, and we end it the Sunday of Labor Day mm -hmm. weekend. So our first visitors enter the site at one o'clock and then the last visitors enter the site at 345. People do not need any kind of reservations. We tried that a couple of years ago. It was really difficult. So <laughs> just show up. And um, a tip if you want to come and visit is um, we always have seem to have big groups right at the beginning of the day, one to 145 ish. Um, and we bring in a new group about about every 15 minutes. We don't want to have too many people waiting to go up to the tower. And everybody wants to go up to the top of the tower. So there's always a little bit of a wait. But it tends to get quiet kind of in the middle of the afternoon. So if you come at 230, 245, it's much quieter and then you kind of you know have a lot more space and there's not much of a wait so that's mm -hmm. my tip that's that's a good tip and i know from experience uh with my local lighthouse here at portsmouth harbor lighthouse, lighthouse with giving tours there it's on a coast guard station but um part of a group that uh, opens it for tours sometimes same thing there's a rush there's usually a line at the beginning it, it always uh, calms down in mid-afternoon and then gets a little busy again towards the end. But that's pretty typical, I think. Yeah. Right. OK, so a little bit about mm -hmm. um, driving and parking. So um, our bridge to West Seattle was broken for a couple of years and it's now reopened so that is going to make it much easier for people to get to west seattle you can put the address of the lighthouse into your gps and it'll get you there sometimes it will take you down that little side street that gets to the north side of the lighthouse and there's no entrance on that side so park on the main street there's plenty of parking usually there's also a little parking lot right there next to the gate um and that is that's public parkings and it's free so um, mm -hmm. if you can find a spot in there go for it during COVID, the Seattle Department of Transportation <laughs> decided to make that both of the streets kind of leading to the lighthouse, like more pedestrian and bike friendly or something. They were thinking that it was crowded or I don't know what their thinking was. But anyway, they decided to put these street closed signs on either end of these, these streets leading to the lighthouse. And the street is actually not closed. Right. I Has saw it that. ever been closed? <laughs> it's local access but local access meaning if you want to go to the beach down the street if you want to go which is public it's a public park if you want to go to the lighthouse if you live down there if you just want to take what well, that's public access absolutely mm -hmm. that's fine so yeah. just drive carefully drive around the sign and be careful because there are a lot of bikes and and people with strollers and things like that do drive very carefully um, but you're absolutely allowed to drive around those signs and go down those streets and mm -hmm. I don't want people to not come visit the lighthouse. We, since the time that they, well, first of all, we had to be closed during the first year of the pandemic. And then the next year, even we had some restrictions on what we auxiliaries could do. So we only did very limited tours in 21. 22, we did the full season, but because the bridge was still broken and because of those signs, I believe we had about half the number of visitors that we normally would. So mm. I'm really hoping that we have we're back to our normal number of visitors this year because we love to share the lighthouse. And frankly, for us auxiliarists, it's it's a big chunk out of our weekend. And but we do it because we love it. Um, but we like to have more visitors, you know, to make it worth it, worth our while. You know, we'd like to have more people come down and visit. Yeah. When I was just there a couple of weeks ago, I saw that street close sign. I thought, <laughs> uh oh, I'm going the wrong way here. But I I took a chance and I kept going and I parked in that little lot. Everything seemed to be fine. So I'm glad you pointed that out. Uh, yeah, I meant to I meant to tell you about that. So yeah. well, that's okay. Everything worked out great. Uh, so you just uh, mentioned uh, you're hoping to get back to your usual numbers for this year with tours. Do you know approximately about how many people you give tours for in a year? It's usually between 1,000 and 2,000 in mm -hmm. a season. Yeah. So yeah. last year was, you know, un under just under 1,000 and mm -hmm. uh, in in recent years before the pandemic it was closer to 2000 i think yeah well that's yeah. that's excellent for some place yeah. that's uh only, only open open once a week yeah special exactly. tours one, once a week yeah so again could you repeat the tour schedule for this coming year what are one of the tours typically given so um it will be opening for tours i believe it's the 28th of may which is the sunday of labor day weekend or, excuse memorial me memorial day weekend. the sunday of memorial day weekend yeah. and um with the exception right now um i know that we won't be doing tours july 4th weekend but other than that i'm pretty sure we're going to be open every sunday but it's not a bad idea especially if people are coming a distance to check our website and our facebook page 
for updates. Um, occasionally mm -hmm. we've had to close for whatever reason. We actually had one uh, one time when there was a really a lot of wind. It was during the summer, but we had a lot of wind and there are some big trees on the property and we were concerned about safety with branches potentially coming down. So sometimes sure. last minute we do have to we have to close. Um, so mm -hmm. it's a good idea before coming on over to just check. Um, but people don't really need to email us um, unless they see an announcement that we're closed. We, we will be open on those Sundays. Uh, I will post the, uh, the web, a link to the website on the, uh, the uh, U.S. Lighthouse Society news blog where this episode will be posted. But uh, for people who are, are listening but aren't necessarily seeing that, uh, I think if they Google Tours Alki, A-L-K-I, Lighthouse, that they'll find that very easily that page i think it comes up first for more information and um i would just say that our um our facebook page is mm -hmm. uh, generally a pretty good place to find information about the tours and updates um, and we do especially in the in season we um we try to keep that pretty updated so it's facebook.com slash alki point lighthouse all run okay. together a l k i point lighthouse and um, so that's a that's actually a really good place to get information. And I believe on that Facebook page, there's also a link to our website and to um, an email address that you can use to ask for more information if you need it. Excellent. That is really, really helpful information. I have one final question for you. OK, and this one's for bonus points. All right. So I hope you got your thinking cap on. You got your number two pencil ready. The question is, what is your favorite thing? What has been your favorite thing about your involvement with Alki Point Lighthouse? Oh, no doubt that it's people visiting from all over the world. We have people from every country and all every state in the United States and, and provinces of Canada. And it, it's just always a challenge to find something that each visitor can connect with, whether it's the human story about what it was like to be a maybe a lighthouse keeper's kid or to talk about the, the technology. Some people are real, you know, here in the Northwest, we have a lot of people work for tech companies and that tech, you know, engineering piece is the thing that they can really hook into. Um, some people just love that you know, it's a beautiful spot with a beautiful view of Puget Sound and, and they just groove on taking pictures with their family and their friends and whatever it is that people are there for, you know, we, we try to deliver, we try to give them a little bit of history, a little bit of the technology story and put our boating safety messages in there because that's, <laughs> that's what we're really passionate about in the Coast Guard Auxiliary. And so just, just encountering all those visitors every summer, that's, to me, that's the best thing. Yeah. I completely and occasionally we have whale visitors and those are pretty special too. So. Whale visitors. What kind of whales are seen there? Well, we do have a, a, a few different kinds of whales in Puget Sound, um, but usually we what we will see is orca whales. Mm -hmm. And we have some um, local pods that um, we'll see frequently if we're watching. If you look, if you look in the right direction, you might see them. Um, and then occasionally we get visiting pods of orca whales and we do sometimes get gray whales. Um, that will come down into Puget Sound. Um, mm -hmm. Whether whether that's a good thing for them, I don't know, because sometimes they have encounters with ships and things like that. It's mm -hmm. not always so great. But um, but whenever people come on site, I say just keep an eye out. And and we have had you know whale sightings and yeah. sometimes other really kind of fun things that happen. There's there are people who do open water swims across Puget Sound, believe it or not. And um, one of the named swims is one that goes from Bremerton all the way to Alki Point. Wow. So a couple of times during my my years there, um, we've had somebody finishing their swim right on the beach down below the lighthouse. And uh, it's just amazing to me that people can do that sort of thing. And yeah, so why somebody would de decide to swim across Puget Sound and they don't they're not allowed to wear wetsuits or grease themselves oh, wow. up. No, swimsuit and bathing cap. That's all they're allowed to wear. Wow. So I guess when it's for like the record books or whatever, you know, uh -huh. the official. Yeah, they have to. Yeah, no wetsuit. Well, uh, again, uh, thank you for arranging uh, for me to have a tour there when I was there a couple of weeks ago. With, oh, I'm uh, glad the it Dosen, worked out. Uh, Dale, the docent uh, was just uh, so nice uh, showing me around and everything, giving me plenty of time. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful spot. And I recommend that people visiting uh, that area, the Seattle area, lighthouse buffs visiting there, or even if they're not that much lighthouse buffs, 
uh, in from uh, Memorial Day to Labor Day. If you're there on a Sunday, uh, get in on one of these tours because it's a it's a special place, and uh, you guys do a tremendous job there. So, Deborah Alderman, I thank you so much for everything. Thanks for being on the podcast. Oh, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me, and uh, we look forward to seeing your listeners down at the Lighthouse sometime this year. As Deborah said in the interview, one of the best ways to keep up with what's happening at Alki Point Lighthouse is the Facebook page, which is at facebook.com slash Alki Point Lighthouse. That's A-L-K-I Point Lighthouse. Another way to get info is to go to the website cgauxseattle.org. On the menu on that page, you'll see Alki Point Lighthouse Tours. One more note for Lighthouse Buffs, they do have a U.S. Society passport stamp at the Lighthouse. So if you visit with your passport during one of their scheduled tours, you can get that passport stamped. Thanks again to Deborah Alderman for the interview and to Dale Vodica for the tour of Alki Point Lighthouse. So, Jen, uh, anything else happening at Point Cabrillo Light Station you'd like to tell people about? I was wondering about the overnight stays. Do they, uh, are, are they already booked for the season? We definitely have a lot of bookings at our vacation rentals out here at the light station, but there's always openings and you can find those on our website at pointcabrillo.org. We also have a lot of um, a lot of tours scheduled for this year. So if you're hoping to climb up to the top of the Point Cabrillo Lighthouse, we're doing a tour on the second Saturday of every month, May through October. So lots of opportunities to climb up to the top. And then one final thing that we're doing, which is uh, relates to those overnight stays, every spring we raffle off a chance to win a four-night stay for eight people in our head keeper's vacation rental. If you'd like a chance to stay at the Point Cabrillo Lighthouse, you can go to our website, pointcabrillo.org, and start your raffle ticket. All of the funds from this raffle go right back into our education programs here at the Lighthouse so that kids can come out on school field trips without having to pay. That's fantastic. What a great idea. And uh, I might have to enter that. I don't know. <laughs> Although, <Absolutely. laughs> yeah, I don't know if I can make it out to Northern California soon, but. <laughs> well, anyway. you got two years. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. In that case, maybe I will. So uh, I have uh, something I wanted to, to tell you about that you may have heard about. I've mentioned it in, I think, the last two or three episodes of the podcast. We're planning to have an event on a day in August, and the, it's probably going to be right around National Lighthouse Day, which is August 7th, but it comes on a Monday this year. So I think this, uh, what we're going to talk about, may be happening on Sunday, August 6th. The idea is that people will gather at lighthouses everywhere and dance to the same song, uh, kind of like a giant flash mob. All of it will be recorded on video uh, for the USLHS YouTube channel. A musician friend of mine, Joe Rivers, is working on a special original song for the occasion. I've heard an early version, and it's fantastic. I think the song's going to be perfect. It'll be danceable, has some nice lighthouse-related themes. Uh, my thought is that groups of volunteers and or staff or members, et cetera, et cetera, at these lighthouses can, can dance or they can get uh, people from a local dance uh, group or school, uh, or it could be a combination of both, you know, whatever people want to do. If people are interested in helping to coordinate this, or if anybody has a group that would like to participate at a particular lighthouse, I would appreciate it if they would email me at jeremy at uslhs.org, jeremy at uslhs.org. Jen, I know you're big on social media and fun events, certainly. Uh, what do you think of this idea? I love it. I love it. Now, I am no dancer myself, but I know we have some local dancing groups here that would love to come out and participate in that. So I'm really excited. Good. I'm glad to hear it. I thought you might like it. Uh, so we'll be talking more about it. And uh, I'm going to be actually sending out a message to an email to uh, Lighthouse groups all, all over alerting them about this soon, but I might wait until the a, a version of the song is ready for people to hear. Uh, but that'll be fairly soon, I think. On next week's episode of Lighthearted, we will have a conversation about the Great Lakes Lighthouse Keepers Association, uh, one of the oldest and biggest lighthouse organizations in the country. And we'll be talking about their volunteer program at St. Helene Lighthouse. So thank you so much for co-hosting again, Jen. Thank you so much for having me, Jeremy. I love this. I love being a part of the U.S. Lighthouse Society. 
Well, the feeling is mutual. Thank you. Uh, So until next time, to all our regular listeners and our new ones, thanks for listening and keep a good light. Everybody.